I just start with the introduction uh, of uh, uh, Dr. So he is the speaker for today. And uh, Dr. Pavan is an innovation evangelist by profession and a teacher by passion. Uh, he is the founder of Inflection Point uh, and pro programs in design strategic acumen consulting skills. Uh, apart from uh, being an adjunct uh, faculty at ISP Hyderabad and IM Bangalore, uh, Dr. Bowen has engaged with companies including Reliance, Tata's, ITC, Flipkart, and Novartis, among others. So, Dr. Bowen is also a mentor at uh, NSR Cell at IM Bangalore. So, NSR Cell is the incubation uh, center at uh, IM Bangalore. Uh, and he's also institute columnist uh, at Estimate Your Story and People. Uh, he's been invited to speak at ISRO as a part of uh, their distinguished and has delivered uh, talks at uh, over 120 uh, press organizations in India and abroad. Uh, was the only Indian to be shortlisted for the prestigious uh, Financial Times and McKinsey Breck and Bowyer. Uh, award for the uh, best business book of the year 2016. He has also been invited five times to speak at TEDx. Uh, for his work on innovation, uh, Dr. Pavan backed the prestigious on the job achiever award at Lakshya in 2007 at NITI in Mumbai. And uh, he's also a gold medalist from MBM Engineering College Jodhpur and uh, did his PGDI from NITI in Mumbai. Uh, Dr. Pavan finished his doctoral studies from IIM Law uh, in the domain of uh, innovation management. So that's quite a profile, sir. And uh, that's why I know it's a privilege to have you here as well today. And it will be a really great for our participants and startups to you know, learn the design thinking uh, nuances from you. Uh, so yeah, over to you, sir. Uh, uh, so we can start with the session. So I'll uh, request everyone to I mute themselves. And uh, post the questions so we can take the questions in the meantime. Uh, if you have any questions, you can put in the chat box, and uh, uh, otherwise, you can also raise your hands and you can, you know, uh, open your mic uh, one by one. Yeah, sure, sir. Over to you. Okay, thank you. So, thank you for the invitation and hosting me on the session today, uh, Gaurav and team. I appreciate that highly. So, Gaurav, what you can do is you can mute all the participants. Yeah. Because accidentally, if uh, somebody uh, gets unmuted, I would not be wanting to preview of their uh, personal chats. That's important. Yeah, right. So the overall approach that we would be adopting is I'll go through the session and after every few minutes, I'll take a pause and I would then take up a few questions. So instead of parking all the questions right to the end, I'll take the questions as and when they come. So my request to everybody would be that if you have a question, please type in at the chat window. I'll pick up the relevant questions, uh, the non-repetitive ones, and I'll try and take those questions up along the journey. So my name is Dr. Pawan Soni, and I'll talk to you about this very important and relevant topic uh, of design thinking. So what I'll be doing is I'll also be using my small electronic slate to convey the messages to you. So this is how it will look like, like this is design thinking. And as and when I type important stuff, I'll relay that across to you. So the first question that begs an answer is that why are we talking of design thinking today? And I have three explanations of why design thinking is important today. The first core explanation is that today we are living in a world where problems are getting multifaceted. 10 years back, 15 years back, 20 years back, if I had to uh, make a shoe, then all I have to care about is the material that goes into the shoe the manufacturing cost, the sales cost, the design of the shoe. But that is no longer true today. I have to also look at how the shoe will get pursued by the people. What kind of a social imaging is the shoe able to create? Is the shoe able to talk to various other devices like a fitness tracker, like uh, a biometric sensor, etc.? And hence the problems have become so multifaceted, so complex, that a complex problem requires a sophisticated level of thinking. So it's not a straight jacketed linear way of thinking. Similarly, if I have to look at uh, post lockdown era and uh, look at the travel and tourism industry, if so if the travel and tourism industry has to pick up after the lockdown gets lifted across the world, the problem is not a straightforward problem to solve. You can't use classic techniques of problem solving, like even uh, critical thinking or lateral thinking. You have to look at a slightly more holistic, slightly more systems way of thinking. So that's the first reason. Just to iterate, the first reason why we need to think of design thinking today is because the problems are getting complex 
and they're getting multifaceted. Okay, let's go to the second reason why design thinking now. See, in the year 1950s, 1960s, all the way to even 1980s, a lot of knowledge, uh, resources in the form of capital, talent, and ideas were limited to a few large organizations. So you would have an AT&T Bell Labs, an IBM Research Labs, a Xerox Park, a Sun, a Microsoft, for example, and they would have a disproportionate clout of gaining and retaining that knowledge. But with the advent of internet and globalization, it is no longer true that the best and the brightest talent would work with Microsoft or with Google or with HP or IBM. They would want to work on their own at their own pace. And thanks to venture capital, they have no obligation to walk up to a big company and uh, surrender their ideas to them. So because of the proliferation of internet, the availability of venture capital, and of course the globalization, which increases travel and commerce, knowledge, ideas, capital, talent, all of that have become democratized, which means that somebody sitting right across the corner can think of a better idea of solving a problem than a government of India lab. And because that somebody can think of a better idea, it is very important that you work with that somebody instead of expecting that somebody to work with you. That's the second reason. And the third reason why we talk of design thinking today is because of pervasive computing, communication, and devices being available, the cost of experimentation and the cost of failure has come down. Let me give you a simple example of what I mean by cost of experimentation and cost of failure coming down. See, I'm sitting in Kormangla right now in Bangalore. Kormangla has eight blocks. Blocks means eight uh, sections of Kormangla have been identified geographically. Suppose I have to think of, and the entire Kormangla is in the red zone because Bangalore is allegedly in the red zone. The entire city, the entire area is in the red zone. But if I have to systematically open up the shops, I can do a quick A-B test. An A-B test would help me understand as to what type of a model works out best. Maybe I can have an alternate day. I can have a shop opening alternate days. I can have shops opening for a specific period of time. I can have a shop opening for a specific capacity of people. I need to ensure that there is enough social distancing made adopted. Using mobile telephony, uh, drones, and uh, CCTV cameras, I can register the progress and the movement of people one week. And then I can decide based on the data which of the model makes more sense. And then I can have the same model proliferate across Kormangla or maybe across the uh, South Bangalore. Which means that the cost of experimentation, the cost of failure has really come down. And I can put more and more experiments. So startups need to learn these things more than anybody else because startups have a very small cost of failure they can't run the company with the mentality of a large enterprise you can fail because frankly speaking nobody was expecting you to be so successful am i right and nobody is expecting you to be successful you have the license to fail and morph yourself into a different type of an organization correct so just to paraphrase the three reasons why we are talking of design thinking today the first reason is problems are becoming multifaceted complex the second reason is that knowledge capital talent ideas are getting democratized and the third reason is that the tools of experimentation have been widespread which means that the cost of failure and cost of experimentation has come down so that is what we are talking about and that is why we are talking about design thinking today now one of the big myths that people have about design thinking is that they think that design thinking is about design now while it was true design thinking was about design till about a couple of years back because if you look at the history of design thinking, the word design thinking draws itself from the discipline of industrial design, product design, and architecture. But in the last couple of years, the principles of design have gotten weaved into enterprise, problem solving at the level of business, society, and commerce. So design thinking is not about design. It is about thinking. It is about designing your thinking. It's not about designing a new product or a solution or a service. No. It is about designing your thinking, thinking about a problem in a very, very systematic manner so that your cost of failure are down. You make lesser and lesser errors and you're closer to your end customer. So that is what is the reason why we're talking of design thinking. That is what is the history of design thinking. So let me pause here and invite a couple of you to pose questions. So as I said before, please type in your questions at the chat box. I'll take a pause for a minute and I'll 
try and address a couple of questions before I move forward. Okay, so I'll try and take up the questions as I said. Okay, uh, Aritra, Aritra has asked that how design thinking strategy helps to design a compact market strategy of a hypothesis idea stage, uh, which will be implemented in future aspects when the final product will be ready means how to make a compact market strategy from an innovation idea by design thinking method. So as I told you before, with, an, with the help of an example, in Kormangla, if I have multiple blocks, I can run one experiment in one block, another experiment, another block. And that is what is called as design of experiments. So what design thinking allows you to do is to design multiple experiments, run them with quick and dirty prototypes, learn with the help of data, and then revise your strategy. Instead of going for a full a flown full stage scale up you look at experiments in a seeded fashion so that is the power of design thinking so ayushi talks about what is the aspect of design thinking through which design imitation or intellectual property infringement can be minimized good question ayushi the answer would be in design thinking there is always a premium on speed okay and in my humble understanding, unless you are a pharmaceutical company or a company which is heavily into intellectual property generation and protection, the only way you can make money out of your intellectual property is not by protecting it. It is by commercializing it as quickly as you can. So the premium is on speed. For example, if I look at the spat between Apple and Samsung, if Apple has lost to Samsung in Japan, Samsung has lost to Apple in America. So it's almost like a zero sum game between Apple and Samsung and nobody seems to win. So instead of trying to drag companies into the court and sue them on intellectual property, you're better off doing something and then commercializing it before others wake up to the realization. The speed, as I said, is of essence in design thinking. And with the help of rapid prototyping and iterative thinking, you're able to build that speed into your execution. How can we practice design thinking from our day-to-day -day activities, asks uh, Aravind. Uh, in the course of the workshop, everybody, I'll talk about three aspects of design thinking. That how can you become a better design thinker? The first key aspect of design thinking is to develop empathy. Empathy in Hindi means sahanubhuti, samvedana. You need to develop empathy so that you can understand people's stated and unstated needs. Not every time people will come to you crying about what they need. Many times you have to go to them. You have to look at the unheard, the unsaid, the unwritten. And that is where empathy is very important. So I would request you all to develop empathy. Point number one. The second aspect that all of you should develop is the ability to develop an experimental mindset. Run experiments. For example, a usual way of conducting a webinar is to put a PPT or to do a voiceover. Now, I did not have a PPT. I'm not even doing a voiceover. What I'm doing is I'm using a small electronic slate. So if I have to write anything, right, I'll write it here and I'll talk about empathy. Now, this is something which is an experiment. Nobody taught me to do it. I just tried doing it and it seems to be working fine. Now, how did I go about doing the experiment? I just took a chance. I just requested uh, the organizers today, Gaurav saying that, you know, I want to try this new method out and he was okay with it and we are doing it. So you need to develop the experimental mindset. And the third thing that you need to develop. So as I said, one is empathy. Second is experimental mindset. And the third thing you need to develop is your ability to, to be a visual thinker. For example, when I was coming down to this session, this is a mind map, which I made. Can you see this mind map? All of you, this is the mind map. Now, this mind map captures what all I wanted to speak today. But if you look at this, this mind map is not like this. It's not a linear way of writing things. It's a pictorial representation of what all I wanted to speak. And I did this just about 10 minutes before the webinar started. This is called visual thinking. Can you think in terms of images instead of text? So that is what are the three things which I would want you to develop. Uh, empathy, uh, experiment. And I would also request all of you to follow notes and uh, visual. 
there are three things visual thinking empathy and experiments and this would really help you tremendously to sort of become better thinkers okay biswajit asks how can a startup have a framework on design thinking generic and business specific so there are a lot of books on design thinking that you can pick up three of the books which i would strongly recommend you to pick up one is called change by design i'll write these three books down uh, change by design this is a book by tim brown second is creative confidence okay and the third book is art of innovation i'm writing these three names down there are three names okay uh, change by design creative confidence and art of innovation these are three books that you can buy and try and see if you can use these books okay um agri dhan writes uh, being in a pro covid zone in agriculture structure we need funding where should we go and approach i think getting funding will be a difficult tricky task right now and i'm not an expert of funding but what i can suggest you to do is to have a tremendous amount of discipline this is a great time to get your house in order for example in a normal time i wouldn't have done this webinar or if i have to deliver a talk at kiit or to a bunch of startups i would have to come to bhuvaneshwar uh, and these guys would have to spend money on my travel my stay and maybe my professional fee but in today's time and age i'm doing this webinar for free and i'm doing this webinar for free because i'm in realizing the importance of free right now so this is a time for all the startups not to worry about fundraising because frankly speaking there is a dearth of money in the marketplace what you need to ensure is that can you get your operations lean can you cut down your costs can you become really trim in terms of your operations and if you can learn to be lean and if you can learn to survive in these tough times when the things go better some of these habits will also continue i'll take this last question uh, you can ask all the questions to me in public there is no need to ask a question to me in private and the reason it is good so that everybody can listen to these questions and hear the answers so viba asks uh, very well pointed out that sometimes uh, someone may have a better solution than say government of india in this complex world uh, where new is a near substitute of disarray situation shouldn't there be an organized system that links or acts as a mediator of intellectual capital say globe there are uh, intellectual capital organizations for example wipo w i p o uh us pto etc but what i want to strongly come to is the fact that real startups or at least the successful startups are not so hell bent upon generating intellectual property patenting intellectual property and trying to fight uh, it out in the courts now what i would strongly recommend all of you to do is ensure that whatever intellectual property you have created try to see that you commercialize it it's very very important there is no point in having a patent if you can't make money out of it so don't fall for that trap your objective so there is a definition of startup or an entrepreneurship or say innovation okay uh, the innovation is about profiting from problems that's it profiting from problems now there are two important words here one is problem second is profit first comes problem then comes profit but profit has to come because you can't survive on the mercy of somebody you can't always expect somebody to keep funding you giving subsidies to you hand holding you you have to be self sustainable viable and that is why profits are extremely important at the three books i'll write the three books down right on the chat box there are three books that uh, you can uh, possibly look at i'll write the three books so please as i said again don't uh, write any message to me in private that's my request okay so that is it uh, as far as the questions go 
what I would want to do now is uh, go back to my presentation, go back to my talk, and uh, we'll have another short burst of question and answers in another maybe 10 minutes from now. Okay. All right. So having said that why we need to have design thinking, uh, what is the origins of design thinking? Let me give you a definition of design thinking and a model of design thinking, which you can possibly start reflecting on. This webinar will go till about 3.30 p.m. So we have uh, at least uh, 40 more minutes with us and we'll try and do justice to your questions and, uh, you know, uh, the, the key messages which I want to deliver. Okay. Okay, great. So now let us come back. So my request to all of you is that don't uh, type anything in chat box right now because it might distract me. So just stop typing and focus on the session. Okay. So design thinking, so if somebody asks you what is design thinking, here is a definition of design thinking. Design thinking is a systematic human centric approach of problem solving. Okay. Now I can use design thinking to develop new products and services. I can use design thinking to even solve day to day problems like ensuring how do people wear masks? How do we ensure that the people maintain social distancing? How to ensure that when the lockdown is lifted, there is not a spike in a number of coronavirus related cases? Or how do we ensure that people are productive when they're working from home? All of these problems can be solved using design thinking. So the first myth which I want to burst is that design thinking is not for startups only. Design thinking is not for tech startups only or for technology products. No. It's a very simple, elegant, systematic way of solving any problem. A problem in your personal life, a problem in your work sphere, a problem around new product development or customer acquisition. So what is design thinking? Once again, please make notes. I want all of you to ensure that you are not doing any multitasking. Okay. If you have registered for this session, be 100% on the session. No multitasking. Don't get distracted at all. Get a notebook, get a pen and get going in terms of taking notes. That's very, very important. Okay, thanks to coronavirus, all of you have more time than what you ever wanted or what you ever bargained for. So don't try to pack too many things in this next 40 minutes or so. Okay, that's a humble request that I have. So design thinking has these five stages fundamentally. And I'll talk about these five stages to all of you. Each stage has a set of tools and techniques that I can share with you. And after every stage, I'll take a pause. I would let you uh, think through the problems and questions that you may have and I'll be happy to respond to these questions. So let me draw the five stage model for you and I would request all of you to tally the same. And another big reason why I did not use a PPT is because PPT often straight jackets the entire discussion. I'm obliged to follow my presentation. I'm obliged to finish it. It has a standard flow which I had in my mind. But this model is far more interactive. It's far more adaptive and it is flexible, of course. So basis your response, your ability to understand and appreciate the concepts. I can modulate my, my delivery and style. So the five stages of design thinking are as follows. I'll write these stages down and then I'll show it to you so that you can also make notes. The first stage of design thinking is called inspire. The second stage is called empathize and define. The third stage is called ideate. The fourth stage is called prototype and test. And the last stage is called scale. Okay. All right. So all of you, first of all, please make a note of these five stages. Inspire, empathize and define, ideate, prototype and test, and scale. These are the five stages of design thinking. Okay. All right. I guess you have taken the notes down. Having said that, let us look at the first stage of design thinking. The first stage of design thinking is called inspire. Inspire means you need to set the big picture. That what is that your startup wants to do? What is your company really intending to do? Many times people start companies because they want to make quick bucks or they are frustrated working nine to five or they want to prove something to the world. I don't think that's a good starting point. 
you don't have to prove yourself to anybody. And if you want to prove yourself to anybody, be rest assured that nobody would get impressed by you also. Your intent should not be to prove yourself to anybody. I'm repeating myself. Your intent has to be to do something meaningful in life. Meaningful as defined by you. So a good startup always starts with a purpose. What is the purpose of your company? For example, when I started my company called Inflection Point, the purpose of my company is to bridge the gap between theory and practice of innovation. There's so much that is available in the space of innovation and creativity, but in terms of practice, very little is being implemented. And I really want to bridge that gap. Somebody like uh, Arvindai Hospital in Madurai, the objective was to eradicate needless blindness. Somebody like an OU Rooms, the objective was to give people affordable stay. So you need to come up with a very simple one-line objective of your company and let the objective be oriented towards your customer and not oriented towards you. Your startup's objective cannot be to be wealthiest, to be successful. It cannot be self-directed. It has to be directed towards others, preferably your customers. That is what I mean by inspire. And so always start with inspire. Inspire is a seed of a problem that you really wish to solve. That's the first stage of design thinking. And in Inspire, what I would want you to start thinking about and read about in the Inspire stage is this. I'll give you two very important books. And this is a very good time to read books. I'm reading books voraciously. Since you have a lot of time, try and build up your vocabulary, build up your knowledge and a bit of perspective. So the first book which I would like you to read is a book by Simon Sinek. It's called Start With Why. Start with why. Okay. In this book, Start with Why, Simon Sinek talks about what you call as a golden circle. Uh, what is a golden circle? In a very rudimentary term, this is like a golden circle. The innermost part of the circle is called why. Why do you exist as a company? The second part of the circle, the second one is called uh, how. How means how are you different than others? How do you deliver your products and services? And the outermost is called what? So let me write it down. What? How? And why? There are three circles. Why? How? And what? There are three circles of the, of the golden circle. So you all have to start with this very fundamental belief that what is the purpose? that you exist, why are you existing? And that has to be meant very clearly to your audience, to your employees, to your customers, to your investors, that is sacrosanct to all of you. And even going forward, when you're looking at investors, what they'll be looking for is a clarity of purpose. And are you here for the long haul or you're just wanting to prove it to somebody, to your uncles and aunts and to your parents that yes, I can also do it. That's not something which they look for. The second stage of design thinking is called as empathy, okay? And this, in my view, is the most important aspect of design thinking, empathy. Empathy means that you are trying to understand the problem from the perspective of the customer. You're trying to empathize with somebody. In Hindi, it is called Samvedana, Samvedan Shilta, Sahanubhuti. So it is not sympathy. It is empathy. It is about understanding others' problems. For example, uh, because of this coronavirus, a lot of uh, four-wheelers are off the road, they are parked, okay? And when the, the whole thing will get lifted, people will try to take out their cars. And as you can understand, if your car is parked for a very long time and you try to crank your car, it doesn't crank, it doesn't start because the battery will be down. One way is to push your car. It may work, it may not work. Second is to call in a mechanic and jump start your car. Now, when people will want to call the mechanic and jumpstart their car, we will not have enough mechanics in the country. Now, this is a very good observation. This is a very good opportunity for you to make money out. But before you try to make money out of it, try to empathize with the person. Try to understand that is it the right time and the right way of making money? Maybe not. Maybe this is the time to go and talk to the person and try to give this cranking service to this person for free. Give it for free and see what happens. If you give it for free, this is a very good opportunity for you to build a rapport with this customer. And tomorrow, who knows, when the customer has money, when he has need, when he has a 
objective of getting the car repaired or doing some top ups on the car he would come back to you so this is the time when you try to empathize with people right it's very critical to empathize with people similarly try to empathize with all those people who are cleaning the streets the sweepers the health care workers the community workers now there are also people like you and me they may not have proper safety gear but what we are expecting them to do is to keep the city clean keep the lights on try to empathize with them that what can i do these are very good opportunity to develop a genuine sense of empathy towards your people towards your customers i'll take a few questions in a short while but before i go to the questions let me finish this stage of empathy and give you three practical tips three three very practical tips i would like to give to you which you can use in your life to develop a genuine sense of empathy all right here's the first tip to develop empathy the first tip is good listening skills be a good listener you know many a times in the startup community a lot of people pride themselves to be a good speaker but if everybody tries to speak who is listening there has to be somebody who must listen to you even investors would like to talk to a person who listens who take advice who has a learnability if you are so smart you all they need if you are so smart and all you need is somebody's money then why will the person be interested in you he will also be interested in mentoring you so be a good listener that's very very important the second thing is be a good observer develop your observation skills go out and see how people react how people behave for example urissa i have only been to urissa uh, to only one city which is bhubaneswar and i have been to a couple of other cities in the country and urissa has a very harsh summer very harsh summer now what i observed was that what kind of mechanisms can be put in place so that people who are as uh, street dwellers who stay stay on the streets who are beggars and who are making a living by being on the street how do we make the summers less intense for them can i observe and try and understand some of the other practices which i can borrow from other parts of the world and bring them here and that is the power of observation which i would like you to sort of practice and third tip that i have for you to become more empathetic in life in general is what i call as delay your judgment there are three tips listen observe and delay your judgment defer your judgment you need to learn to delay your judgment don't be very judgmental because when you become judgmental you have stopped learning oscar wilde very famously said once that not everything can be good in anybody but something can be good in everybody because every saint had a past and every sinner has a future i'll repeat every saint had a past and every sinner has a future which means that all of us have this ability of reviving our fortunes we cannot be judgmental towards others if you become too judgmental you are not listening to the unsaid you are not being open to correct your assumptions right so just to summarize what i have spoken to you so far are two stages of design thinking the first stage is inspire it talks about the purpose of using design thinking the purpose of your organization your startup and the second stage is called empathy where you try to understand the problem from a user perspective and not your perspective from a customer's perspective and there are three tips which i have given you to develop a genuine sense of empathy the first is good listening skills the second is good observation skills and third is your ability to delay your judgment once again i'll take a pause here and i would request you type in your questions in public please go ahead please type in your questions all of you
So, uh, okay. are there any questions? So, I think uh, no one is typing there. Anyone having? So, can you please do it right now? Yeah. So, Biswajit had a question. Um, how to identify a problem and validate if it is a problem? Right. It's a good question. So, look at a problem which is recurring in nature. Because many times what we encounter as a problem is not necessarily a problem. It is basically a symptom. For example, and I would, it's a good question. I would like to give you an example here. I uh, suppose you go to a doctor. Okay. Dr. A, there are two doctors, Dr. A and Dr. B. Both are equally good in terms of their medical practice, but behaviorally they are quite different. You go to Dr. A and Dr. A asks you a question. So what's your problem? And this is how you start your response. You say that I have a severe headache. I'm not able to sleep at night. I have lost my appetite. I feel weak all day long. I don't feel like eating anything, etc., etc. Now, what you are essentially talking to the doctor, is it a problem or a symptom? I guess it's a symptom. Now, for your own body, the language which you prefer to use is not the language of the problem, but it's the language of the symptom. And even without listening to you completely or without trying to do a diagnosis, if the doctor simply scribbles down on a sheet saying that, okay, got it, got it, two medicines, go home, take them and you'll be fine after two days. So you look at the medicines, you pop in those pills and you're okay. Cut the discussion to Dr. B. Dr. B has the same qualifications. He asks you the same question, which is, what's your problem? You give the same answer, which is a headache, you know, running nose, loss of appetite, feeling weak all day long, but he did not prescribe you a medicine. On the contrary, what he asks you is more questions. And through this investigation, he is able to make you understand what the problem is. And then at the end of the discussion, he says, there's no fundamental issue with you. You have just been over exhausted. Go home, take rest, don't work for two days, eat some light food and you'll be fine. So Dr. A does not listen to you gives you medicines and you're fine. Dr. B listens to you, does not give you medicines and you're fine. Now tell me all of you, which doctor would you trust more, A or B? You can type in your answers. Which is a trust doctor you will trust more, A or B? Yeah, so most of you are saying it is B. And the reason why you will trust the Dr. B is because Dr. B listens to you. He understood you. He understood your problem and made you understand your problem. And that is how you need to understand the problem. A problem is something that is hidden. Whenever somebody talks to you about a problem, please understand that they are not talking to you about the problem. They're talking to you about a symptom. A problem is always covered around a symptom. And if you look at the symptom, the problem might get deep, buried deep under. You need to understand that the symptom is not the problem. The problem is under. And you use techniques like root cause analysis, uh, probing techniques, fishbone diagram, uh, mind mapping and other methods to really unearth the problem. And that is what I want you to learn. So to your question, Biswajit, a problem is something that is hidden deep under. So don't sort of uh, look at it narrowly from the perspective of a symptom. You also ask, how do you validate a problem? Well, the only way of validating the problem is with the customer. You have to paraphrase the problem. Okay, that is what I'm understanding. So what you are saying is that in the last two days, you have been feeling very tired. Is that right? Person says, yes, that is right. Has it happened before? You, he says, yeah, it happened once in summers also when I was over exhausted. So now you see you're doing your, it's happening to you because you're exhausted. Can that be the reason? So with the customer, you have to quote discover the problem. Don't come up with this position of authority or position of expertise saying that I will tell you what the problem is. No, the problem has to come from the customer. You have to be the vehicle which allows the customer to express the problem and not the one who tells the problem. That's very, very important. Okay. Uh, okay. Uvarani says, what is an effective way to observe customer needs in a healthcare sector? I think there are a lot of techniques, but I'll talk to you about two techniques. The first technique is called anthropology or ethnography. What I mean by anthropology or ethnography is to actually become the customer. You almost be the patient and you spend a day with the patient, just right next to the patient and try to observe the hardship that the patient goes through. 
The second technique is called the diary research. Diary research means you give a customer a small diary and ask the customer to write her emotions at various points in the day. For example, somebody is a diabetic patient. So you have to make the customer write down the emotions or the problems that the customer faces right throughout the day, maybe over a week or over a month. And that diary will give you a very good insight and understanding about the customer state of mind. So ethnography, anthropology, diary research, customer clinics is another way in which you uh, look at uh, understanding the customer. So I'll give you two good resources which you can use to learn more of these techniques. I'll write them down on my notebook. And maybe you can make a note yourself. The first is called IDOU. IDOU stands for IDO University, IDOU. And the second stands for Stanford D School. Stanford D School, Stanford Design School. So both of these are very useful uh, resources which you can use and they'll be giving you a lot of techniques that you can possibly use to develop your skills of uh, observation. Vijay asks, uh, can you share some examples of design in services industry? Of course, one of the good examples of using design thinking in services industries is the airlines. So uh, Singapore Airlines is treated as one of the world's uh, best airlines. And what Singapore Airlines has done quite comprehensively is to map the entire customer journey. From the point the customer books a ticket all the way to the time when the customer takes a cab or a bus to go to the destination after ailing from the uh, allying from the aircraft so what singapore airlines did is look at the entire journey end to end and look at the various points of the journey whether the customer feels anxious uh, stressed out because of a jet lag etc and what services can i offer to the customer similarly walt disney while making the theme parks has done a tremendous amount of work on design thinking. Back in India, one organization which uses design thinking very extensively is Big Bazaar. So when Big Bazaar was setting up its own uh, pantaloons and Big Bazaar stores, they very carefully understood the workflow of the customer from entry all the way to billing and getting out of the place. Uh, Titan is another example. Titan Industries has very painstakingly designed its showrooms of Tanishq to give a very superlative experience of browsing and purchasing to the customer. So a lot of good examples in India uh, where design thinking has been used in service industries. Okay, Pulkit Jan, uh, how do I judge if a short term problem like one rising out of lockdown is worth pursuing and diverting my company's resources even if the customer is in my current focus? It's a very good question, Pulkit. It's a very good question. So the the objective of solving short term problem is not always to make money or to develop a capability. Often the objective of uh, solving these short term problems is to get uh, acclimatized to problem solving or to present a name for yourself. And that can be your strength. So uh, what, what you need to understand is a crisis is a very important activity to be put to waste. Uh, and Winston Churchill made this statement at the end of the World War II that don't let a good crisis go to waste. So what I want is that while the crisis may not be the exact problem that you would like to solve, but don't waste it also. Because this crisis can give you a self-confidence that yes, you can solve problems quickly. This will make a name for you in the marketplace. This can even get yourself a good uh, traction with uh, potential customers. I'll give you an example. There is an NGO called Goonj. When in Kedarnath and Badrinath, we had uh, the avalanche and landslide that happened a couple of years back, they ran a drive to collect cloths. Now, in the normal circumstances, it would have been very difficult for them to make a brand for yourself, this company called uh, Goonj. But what Goonj could do in that period of uh, the heavy rain and landslide that happened in Uttaranchal area is to make a good brand and a good PR for themselves. Similarly, Ola. When rain and flooding happened in Chennai, Ola deployed Ola boats, if you, have, if you remember. Now, Ola boat is not a service that they will offer to you today. You don't see Ola boat. But that was a very good opportunity for Ola to demonstrate their CSR, corporate social responsibility, demonstrate their quick wit and way of thinking and develop a customer traction 
and uh, loyalty so i think even if the uh, this this current crisis may not give you money may not make you address your customers directly or develop a new service offering this is a good opportunity to at least experiment and i would definitely not want you to let this particular opportunity go to waste full kit uh okay so uh, arvind asked what is the second book after start with why the second book i did not talk about it but uh, the second book is called drive uh, d r i v drive by daniel pink this is the book drive by daniel pink so drive is a very good book that talks about what drive what motivates employees uh, many of you may be entrepreneurs you would have teams so it's very important that you keep your teams motivated so this book talks about employee motivation okay uh, naturally fire swapnil says how do we validate the problem with the proposed target segment in this situation of lockdown as we cannot reach them personally see i cannot reach you personally also but we are being creative in using this webinar so i don't think personally reaching out to people is a limiting factor what i would recommend you to do is to be very creative use mobile phones chats and other mechanisms of reaching out to the customers and lockdown would be lifted in a, in just about a few weeks time and then you will be far more mobile so use the opportunity to develop other creative ways of validating your problems but as i said importantly what is a good problem here is a good problem uh, keep this venn diagram in mind all of you this venn diagram a good problem has three conditions the first condition is that you should be able to solve the problem better than anybody else number 1 number 2 if you can solve the problem the customer will get a lot of value out of it okay and number 3 by solving the problem you should be able to make money so let me write these three conditions down on which problem you should solve the first condition is unique very conditions okay what is the first condition the first condition that you need to have is that the customer should value it the second condition is you should be able to solve it uniquely which means it's not a commodity and third thing is you should be able to make money out of it now tell me out of all the three conditions what is the most important condition you can type in the chat between money differentiation and value to the customer what should be the most important condition to solve the problem please write it down guys absolutely correct value to the customer okay if customer values it they will pay money if customers value it you will be able to develop more capability of differentiating yourself but the key thing is customer value and that is what is the key ethos of design thinking we call this as customer centricity be centric to your customer let me take a couple of more questions very quickly before i move on we have about 10 minutes with us now i'll stretch a bit more and maybe take a few more questions how can you differentiate between the major and the minor problems sometimes major problems are looked as minor problems in our view how do you resolve it a problem is something that is enduring uh, jeff bezos when jeff bezos was asked that how do you make a long term strategy jeff bezos always says that when you are making a long term strategy focus on the permanence and not the variables focus on the problems which will be permanent with the customer and he says there are three problems that are worth solving in the e-commerce space one is speed of delivery second is uh, the choice given to the customer more choice and third is the cost and speed cost and choice are the three problems that will remain forever so i'll put my focus on these three problems and that's what uh, uh, bill gates also said bill gates said that 80% of your time should go on 80% of your revenue 80% of your time will go on 80% of your revenue so if you have to choose between problems look at the problems that will give you highest money if you solve them keep that in mind highest money okay 
I don't run behind all the problems. Okay, uh, Archana Sinha, health diagnostic sectors. A very good example I want to give to you is General Electric, GE. So GE, and I would recommend you to go and check it out for yourself, called the GE Adventure Series. So GE made a series of, uh, uh, you know, MRI machines using design thinking principles. So please go ahead and check it out. Okay, Vijay says, in product design with customers in mind, functional design aspects are more focused and tangible. Uh, yes, functionality is always more important than aesthetics in design thinking. How do you think about intangible design aspects? So intangibility, uh, if you look at it, in services, there's a lot of intangibility. When you look at intangibility, one of the ways of understanding intangibility is with a very powerful technique called storyboarding. Let me write these two techniques down. One is called storyboarding. And second is called storytelling. Okay, storyboarding and storytelling. Storyboarding and storytelling are two very powerful techniques to visualize. And there's a third technique which you can use for designing of services. The third technique is called scenarios. Scenarios. Okay, storyboarding, storytelling, and scenarios. So, scenarios is another very powerful technique where you can visualize the actual journey of the customer through your service engagement. And what are the points of intervention that you need to tighten up? So that's how you uh, sort of uh, visualize the intangibles. Okay, so image is getting blurred if I can write on a normal piece of paper. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not carrying a normal piece of paper right now, but uh, I'll try and see what I can do best. Okay. All right. What's the other question? Please give examples of operational long term design thinking examples where empathizing not only with customers but also with the mother nature in the central focus and how the second aspect can be made to be a center of whole process of design thinking uh, of your belief in this. Okay. So, Rishi, it's a good question. So, we have a concept called the triple bottom line. Okay. Uh, I think. <clears throat> the distance between the screen and the uh, and my notepad can be a reason why the image is getting blurred. I'll try to adjust that because I don't have a white paper with me right now. And I'm just trying to be conscious about mother nature here of not wasting too much of white paper. So there is a concept called triple bottom line. Okay. Um, Okay, is it better now? I guess, yeah, now I guess it will be better. Triple bottom line. So triple bottom line basically means that you have to look at three things. One is people. Second is planet. And third is profit. People, planet and profits. Now, when you look at all the three things, people, planet, and profit, you have to ensure that all three are coming together for it to happen creatively. And that is how people, planet, and profit. So people means employees and customers. Planet means Mother Earth, sustainability, and nature. And profit means bottom line. And profit is important. Uh, I don't think that you as entrepreneurs should uh, develop a distaste towards profit. It's very important to be profitable because if I was not making profits, I wouldn't have time to do this webinar. If I was not making profits, I didn't have money to buy books. If I was not making profit, I didn't have money to buy this kind of stylus marker and talk to you. So profit is important, but how do you channelize the profit is very, very important also. So I think in design thinking, we look at three aspects which we need to sort of uh, balance. And uh, so, so, so this is where, uh, What's the name of the gentleman? Yeah, Rishi. So Rishi, this is where we look at the three aspects in design thinking also. So here are the three aspects. So the Venn diagram, which I'm referring to here, 
are the three elements in the Venn diagram. The first is called desirability. Second is called viability. And third is called feasibility. Okay. Desirability, viability, and feasibility. And these are the three aspects that have to come together for a design thinking to happen. Desirable to the customer, viable for the business, and feasible in terms of technology. And how we bring viability, feasibility, desirable together is how you do design thinking. Okay. So let me go to the, I have the last 10 minutes with me. I'll go to the last section of design thinking. So, so far we discussed about uh, two stages, which is the inspiration stage and the empathy stage. I'll quickly go to the third stage and the remaining stage I would encourage you to read on your own uh, because the objective was to develop a curiosity in you. And uh, if you read these books, if you do a lot of researching yourself, you should be able to get a good amount of material. I'll also share some of my YouTube links, which you can use to get a more uh, better understanding of design thinking. Let me type these links right now on the on the chat. Okay. So these are recorded sessions on design thinking, which I would strongly recommend you to try and see for yourself. <clears throat> Just bear with me for a moment. Let me share this with you. In the meanwhile, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to pen them down. I'll be happy to take those questions. Okay. All right. So please check this one out. I've shared a link to you on YouTube that will give you a lot of perspective on design thinking. Lovely. Okay. All right. So I would the last stage of design thinking. Uh, very quickly. So we had uh, inspiration. We had empathy. Then we have define. So define is where you pick the problem which is worth solving. And I want to offer two important perspectives to you here. The first perspective is that you need to learn not every problem is worth solving. You might have all the money in the world. You might have all the uh, all the time also in the world and the energy, of course. But still, please understand that you should pick the problems which you think are worth solving. And what's the problem which is worth solving? A problem which is worth solving is the one that makes a real difference in somebody's life. Not a very trivial difference, a real difference. Okay. The second thing is that not every problem is solvable. You see, we often find it very difficult to understand that how is it possible that you can't solve a problem? Well, if you cannot solve a problem, try to minimize the impact of the problem. Let me give you an example. Now, one of the big problems that we have in India is uh, traffic at least in the city of bangalore where i am staying right now is traffic situation and the moment lockdown opens the whole city will go crazy with the amount of traffic that we have here one of my friends who owns a sandro he was driving himself and was uh, frustrated with the city traffic so he gets promoted in his job and instead of trying to buy a bigger car and still get frustrated with the traffic what he did is that he got a chauffeur for his sandro now, what it does is that the chauffeur drives the car, he sits on the rear seat, he has bought a Kindle, and he reads books on Kindle. Every week, he finishes one book on Kindle, every week. Now, what happens as a result is that he is thankful to the city traffic. Now, the same city traffic which he was frustrated about is helping him finish one book every week. Now, did he solve the problem of Bangalore city traffic? No, he didn't solve the problem. What he did? He reduces the impact of the problem on his life. And that is what is design thinking. Design thinking means that even if you cannot solve a problem, can you be creative to reduce the impact of the problem on your life? And if you can reduce the impact of the problem on your life, the problem can live and so can you. 
And that is what is called define, which is define the unit of the problem, which is really worth going after. Once you define the problem, then you go for ideation. Generate as many ideas as possible. And here, quantity is more important than quality of ideas. I'll repeat myself. Quantity of ideas, which means volume of ideas, is always more important than few good ideas. Once you have a bunch of ideas, how do you know which ones are really good? You look at prototyping those ideas. You can develop prototypes using simple things like clay models, wax, uh, post-it notes, Lego blocks, scenarios, storyboards, storytelling, skits, mock-ups, uh, so many techniques of prototyping. And then you put those prototypes all the way to test. And that's critical. For example, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi used design thinking principles to impose lockdown. For example, before uh, on 24th of uh, March, we went for nationwide uh, lockdown. A uh, couple of days before that, he went with something called Janta Curfew. Janta Curfew was a prototype of a 21 day lockdown. He wanted to test how disciplined people are on themselves when I request them to have a lockdown. And there was a prototype before you scale the entire thing. Correct. If in the absence of prototype, we would have put that 21 day lockout, people would have gotten frustrated. People didn't understand how to respond to it. But when they were given a choice to do it on their own and they did it, they got the confidence that yes, this is doable. And today, almost a, more than a month now, we are pretty okay with the lockdown situation. We are complying with it. It happened because we had a prototyping approach to the whole thing. So these are the stages of design thinking. I'll pause here. And maybe we can take a few more questions in the next five minutes. And at 1540, I would like to close the session. Okay, so Biswajit Pradhan asks, uh, how startups can be responsible towards sustainable development goals using design thinking? So I guess if you can have a focus on all the three aspects, which is what is good for your customer, what is good for your company, and what is good for the mother nature in terms of the right technologies being used. For example, why am I using this technology and not a white paper? Because I know in the process of making white paper, I'll end up wasting a lot of white paper and I'll never use it again, right? And that's one simple way of trying to cut down the uh, cost in terms of carbon footprint. Similarly, in your own company also, you have to have very smart ways in which you can start doing that. Uh, there is a company called ID Fresh Food that make idli dosa butter. Now, one of the big mission statements that ID Fresh Food has is how do you ensure that we don't use plastic for packaging? Similarly, if you go to McDonald's, Earlier, McDonald's used to give those small sachets of ketchup. Every time you take a burger, you get the ketchup sachet. These days, they don't give you a ketchup sachet. They give you a small plastic or a paper cup. And there is a ketchup dispensing machine kept somewhere. And you take the ketchup, whatever you use. So this way, they have reduced the wastage. They have reduced plastic. And they have increased reusability. You see? So in every company, if you are creative enough, you can really make a huge impact in terms of cutting down on plastic. A lot of packaging has become plastic-free especially of soaps uh, and uh, garments. Garments have cut down a lot of plastic usage in their packaging. So that is a lot of avenues for you to be a good thinker. A design thinker is a holistic thinker. Keep that in mind. So you're not just focused on profits or only customers or only environment. All the three things have to come together uh, for design thinking to happen. I can take two more questions and then I would like to sign off. We have time for two questions, guys. Okay, so Rishi asks to motivate us, uh, please give us an example of startup using design thinking where it was made possible to empathize not only with people, but also with the needs of mother nature right from the very beginning of the commission all the way to the end. So one example I told you is ID Fresh Foods, which you should consider as a startup. Paperboat is another company. Uh, Paperboat uses a lot, of, uh, lot less plastic in its packaging and product design than you can think of. A uh, lot of other new startups like Oyo Rooms. Oyo Rooms also has a policy of ensuring that there are, you know, uh, water usage norms. 
another company that i can think of is lemon tree uh, i've been staying at lemon tree quite a, for quite a time now and lemon tree has this very smart uh, placards uh, put in their bathrooms and uh, in bedrooms where they request that if you only if you want your towels to be changed you put them on the floor otherwise if it is on the bed or hanging somewhere as we will not change it so these small nudges can really help you change the way people perceive technology and people perceive services and because you're a startup you can really challenge the dominant logic you can challenge the conventional wisdom and if you do not do it then, then there is no point in being a startup you might as well be a part of a large company Raghav Garodia asks, how do you make a decision when sustainable solution of packaging can lead to big increase in product pricing to analogous products? See, customers can pay a premium. Do you think customers pay a premium for organic food? Answer is yes, they pay a premium for organic food, provided you can prove them that the food is organic. Similarly, customers will be willing to pay provided you can show the value to the customer please understand that so i think in today's time and age there are those customers who, if you can resonate with their belief system if you can resonate with their value system they will be ready to pay a premium for that particular thing they will and you need to be very experimentative and very creative in communicating it to them that yes we are doing it because we love nature and if you love nature see if you can pay a premium it all goes back to nature so you have to be really creative in that aspect Okay, Dr. Ashok Kumar asks, can the design thinking once made should be changed over time for a better product life cycle? Absolutely, yes. The key of design thinking is iterative nature. You should not settle for the solution that comes to your mind instantly. You have to keep revising your solution and making it better and better. So it is not casted in stone. The whole idea of design thinking is to be responsive to the situations faster than what you would be in a classic product life cycle or a waterfall model. Rubeka asks, uh, what are few other aspects other than the ones you discussed, which is considered while going for an idea uh, till that will persist? I guess uh, one thing I told you is go for quantity over quality, which is more ideas would lead to better ideas. And second is look at counterintuitive ideas. I would give you two uh, suggestions, two books, or two lines of thoughts for you to think about. One is called the nudge theory. I'll write these two names down. Uh, nudge theory, N-U-D-G, nudge theory. So nudge theory is to kind of nudging people or poking in their ribs to kind of make them think better. That's one very powerful way in which you make people uh, work differently. And the second is, a lot of ideas can germinate with the power of free people often do not use the power effectively so i would like you to start thinking that how can you use the power of free to develop goodwill with your customer to develop social equity with your customer with your investors for example this webinar we are doing for free i do not know how will somebody today get inspired to do something different i don't know anybody of you including Gaurav. This is the first time I'm talking to him. I do not know anybody in the audience, but still my passion does not change whether this webinar is free or paid. It doesn't change. And the same applies to you. So I guess with the power of free and nudge theory and focusing on rapidly putting your ideas to test, you can generate a lot more ideas. And frankly speaking, ideas is the currency of startups. Uh, it is not money, it's ideas. Uh, and then followed by that talent. So that is what my view would be on ideation. If you look at this webinar, which I've shared with you on YouTube, you will get some other answers around how do you use uh, design thinking for product development. Okay, let me take the last question and then I'll sign off. Okay, I guess there is no last question then. So. Rubika's was the last question, it seems like. So Gaurav, over to you. Uh, thank you for your uh, time and patience in hosting this uh, webinar. I hope this was uh, valuable. Gaurav, thank you so much again. And thank you everybody thank you else so much. for your uh, you wonderful so much, questions. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah, you for wonderful was, questions. Uh, yeah, such an enlightening session. 
and formative session uh, on design thinking and, and you busted a lot of myths there for the startups and uh, i suppose i mean we'll be doing a lot of uh, you know upcoming sessions with you as well on design thinking for the startups because we keep doing all those uh, you know uh, conferences and uh, seminars thank you startups and uh, uh, we look forward thank you so much uh, participants uh, we'll be coming up with the next webinar as well uh, so just share uh, your feedback with us and we'll be coming up with the next topic and uh, yeah i mean thank you so much sir for joining us today and you know uh, uh, sharing your uh, you know learnings with us and you know it will be it, it's a really great you know knowing from you uh, all the thank you things. thank it's, you all the best to have, you know, i've shared my email address yeah and you can write to me with your questions and comments at a later point in time also thank you all the best sure, to you. Sure. take yeah. care thank bye. you so much sir yeah bye, bye.